to serve as active layers in photovoltaic devices or solar cells. The advantages include mechanical flexibility as opposed to their inorganic counterparts, silicon solar cells. As you can see here, we have the possibility of an increased surface area configuration with respect to viewing from the sun, allowing for more uh, incoming light onto the solar cell. In addition, these devices are lightweight as well as inexpensive. In terms of fabrication, the cost of a microfabrication facility to make a silicon solar cell is tremendous as compared to the facilities required to fabricate organic solar cells. In addition, they have the potential for aesthetic value. As you can see, here is a uh, leaf-like photovoltaic cell made from organics, which can be made into, for example, a field of trees as opposed to a looming field of plates of inorganic solar cells. Now the conventional approach for organic solar cells is polyfreehexathiophene phenyl butyric acid methyl ester, or P3HT PCBM solar cells. Um, there is an active layer that is on the order of 100 nanometers in thickness. The, the, the proton, the uh, electron donor, sorry, is P3HT, and the electron acceptor is PCBM. This polymer fullerene blend has the problem of a tortuous path for the electron and hole once they have been separated from a bound exciton configuration. And the major problem is that the thermodynamic equilibrium tends towards macrophase separation, where there is a bilayer of P3HT and PCBM, each of which is on the order of 50 nanometers in thickness. Now, the exciton diffusion length is on the order of 10 nanometers. So the likelihood that an exciton would be able to diffuse and separate into an active electron and hole is dramatically decreased. So um, a cost analysis that was done in the literature for the P3HT PCBM system indicates that we have an estimated lowest achievable cost of about $7.50 per watt. This is about five times that for amorphous silicon solar cells. The innovative emphasis for organic solar cells in the past 10 years has been both in device structure and in material selection. And material selection has been the most active <coughs> in, the, um, in the UK and the device structure in the US. Now there can be a significant cost reduction that can be achieved in dollars per watt through new high performing active materials. And so I will be focusing on in my study both material selection and fabrication process. A novel approach that we will be using here is a block copolymer active layer approach. The advantages include that these dye block copolymers self-assemble into microphase structures. And for example, we have block A here, which can be modeled as a coil or um, like a flexible rope. And block B can be modeled as a rigid rod, like a beam or column. And the, uh, the microphase separation can constitute itself into, for example, lamellar or layered structures, where block A and block B have both um, macrophase separated layers, microphase separated layers on the order of 10 nanometers, which is the exciton diffusion length. So we have a much higher probability that it will be able to diffuse and separate into an electron and hole. The microdomain size is tunable through the molecular weight of each polymer block. And the morphology is tunable by the volume fraction of the rod and coil block, respectively. We would like lamellar phases, which corresponds to a volume fraction of from the order of 0.5. And covalent bonding constraint eliminates the problem of macrophase separation exhibited in the P3HT PCBM system. The objectives of this study were first to develop a new approach with the potential to make polymer photovoltaic cells, and then to determine how ordering in these thin films depends on three parameters, the end group, chemical termination of the substrate, the amount of time spent <coughs> solvent annealing, which I will discuss, and the solution sonication or not sonication prior to spin coating, which is a processing method for the solution. <coughs> the material used in this study was polyfreehexathiophene block polyethylene glycol, where the polyfreehexathiophene block, or P3HT, is again the whole carrying block. And the electron carrying block will be polyethylene glycol later backfilled with conducting nanoparticles. So from the 
phase diagram, we can see that we expect a lamellar or layered morphology. And this is beneficial in that the tortuous path will be eliminated once the electron and hole are separated in the configuration in the previous slide. And the P3HT has a contour length that is calculated to be on the order of 8.6 nanometers. And the polyethylene glycol block has a <coughs> radius of gyration, two times the radius of gyration, for a coil type polymer of about six nanometers. These are beneficial for the 10 nanometer exciton fusion length. The method used, as opposed to the thermal annealing conventional approach, which is an energy consuming process, is solvent vapor annealing, which is a much lower consumption process because it can be conducted at room temperature. And an inert atmosphere for the polymer is achieved through a nitrogen source, as this polymer is air sensitive. We have here a, a solvent annealing chamber, which is glass, and therefore can be used with organic solvents. The nitrogen is bubbled into the solvent, and the vapor pressure of the solvent in the chamber can be controlled by bubbling rate. The unannealed film becomes swollen, and this allows for mobility of the chains, which are mobilized with a mutual solvent for the two blocks. So the first variable we explored was the effect of substrate termination on ordering in the film. When we base treated the substrate, leading to an oxygen termination of model silicon substrates used, we have a topographical morphology that is irregular and evolves in an irregular fashion. Whereas when we have a base treated substrate, we have a discrete step height that is noted of eight nanometers. This is commensurate with the calculated contour length of the poly 3 hexafiabene semiconducting block. And we see that for zero hours of solvent annealing, as cast, we get this quantized step height, which is a fundamental quantity that did not depend on the processing. And with time, we see the evolution of the morphology with solvent vapor annealing. From one hour to 12 hours, we see the nucleation and growth of higher rims, followed by this giving way to a convex structure and the holes in the island hole morphology shown here, this is a topographical AM, AFM or atomic force microscopy image, is that the islands become interconnected, um, the, the holes become interconnected or continuous. So we do see morphological evolution with solvent vapor annealing. And we found that if we did not sonicate the solution, which is a process by which you submerge the solution in a water bath and, sub and subject it to vibrations on the order of sound waves and frequency, we see that micelles form in solution and are transferred onto the substrate. And fractal structures shown here that are branching structures from a central micellar nucleus result. This means that the solvent that we used, toluene, is not a perfect mutual solvent for the polymer in question, and, polymer, and uh, solvents can be explored in the future. Now, the morphological evolution for the non-sonicated and non-base treated substrate system can be analyzed due to the quantized step height. We see that with solvent annealing time, there is first a significant increase in the diameter of the holes or the lower layer, as well as a decrease in the area percent of islands. This corresponds to the first stage of vertical coarsening in evolution. We have this followed by lateral coarsening and multilayer formation supported by the quantitative data. So first, we would like to discuss the morphology on oxide substrates versus the base. The base has a frustrated morphology, as we discussed. And without the base, we have this quantized step height of 8 nanometers corresponding to that of the P3HT. And phase images in the atomic force microscopy indicate that this was a uniform phase, indicating that P3HT entirely wets the surface as its semiconducting block. For a short solvent annealing time, we see a single island hole layer. And for long solvent annealing times, we eventually see the emergence of multilayer formation. Whereas um, when you sonicate the solution, you have P3HT wetting the surface. If you do not sonicate the solution, you find, in fact, a favorable configuration, a favorable configuration of perpendicular lamellae or layer structures, which allows for electrons and holes to travel vertically a very short distance once they have reached the interface and separated. 
And in the case of longer annealing times, we actually see a wetting of the polyethylene glycol block on the surface, as indicated by contact angle measurements, which is a measure of the hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity of a surface. And so we conclude that substrate termination, phase termination in actual leaf frustrate assembly, which was not expected, and the annealing time leads to first vertical and then lateral coarsening of the island. And the solution sonication prior to spin coating improves the self-assembly, but without sonication, we see a lateral phase separation that we're looking for for photovoltaic devices, and we will explore this morphology further. Now, solvent annealing has been shown in this study to, ship, to be providing a simple and versatile approach, enabling self-assembly of these functional dibloco polymers that have the potential for solar cell applications. And as you can see here, we have our goal diagram with functionalized nanoparticles that can be segregated into the electron carrying block. I would like to acknowledge my research group as well as contributions from the ARO Young Investigator Award and the NSF Foundation and the facilities of the Nano Bio Interface Center. I welcome any questions and thank you very much.